welcome to one of three webinars that uh, election, Elections Canada is putting on in collaboration. We're just hosting these great webinars. We're very excited. Um, but they're Indigenous experiences, stories and voices in elections and democracy. There's also one French one as well next week. So if you have any colleagues, please feel free to share and let them know. Um, just to get us started, I'm just going to just briefly talk about who we are, and then I'll turn it over to um, Melissa. But we're um, OHASTA ASO. Uh, we're just a group of volunteer teachers who are really passionate about history and social sciences. Um, we volunteer our time to try and connect with teachers across the province to act as a voice between teachers and organizations and even the Ministry of Education. Uh, we've been doing this for a while, since 1978, and we are very grateful for our community partners like Ontario Teachers Federation because they're kind enough to let us use this lovely Zoom platform. We have a great website. You can find us on X <laughs> or uh, Facebook. And now even Instagram, so we're always sharing and posting and blogging. So, um, you know, find us, connect with us. We want to connect with you. Okay. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your precious summer to be with us this evening. I am thrilled to be here on behalf of Elections Canada and to just begin our first webinar of this series. Of course, I'd like to thank OHASTA for giving us the space to learn together. So big thank you to OHASTA and Sarah for organizing and making this happen. So our topic today is Indigenous experiences and stories. And, and this topic did not come out of nowhere. In fact, it came from all of you. It came from an increasing demand from teachers to learn about Indigenous experiences and stories, especially with uh, the new course, the NBE course, as we are all aware, as well as changes in the curriculum. And of course, this work is so important in, in this this journey of truth and reconciliation that we are on. So I'm very excited for this series and I hope you are too. With that, I, I'm just going to dive right in and begin with an agenda so we know what is uh, very excitingly coming our way in the coming hour. Uh, so of course, we'll begin with some introductions and a conversation with my wonderful colleague, Ashley Nirmala. I'm so excited for this session, and I am so excited that all of you will have the opportunity to learn from Ashley as well. Uh, after this, we will have a chance to explore Elections Canada's very own Voting Rights Through Time resource. Not only will you be able to learn about this resource, you will also get to experience it through our blended learning tools. Now, I know that is a very COVID term, but it is still very useful. Look at us using it now in our online context. And this resource is great because it speaks to the main theme of this webinar, which is who are Indigenous peoples. And following that, we will have an opportunity to ask some questions to Ashley. So definitely keep those questions top of mind and pop them in the chat. And we are happy to address those uh, when it is time for the Q&A. All right, you guys excited? I know I am. All right, so let's go ahead with uh, and begin this with land acknowledgement. And uh, where I am, uh, of course we are Ohasa, but oh oh, Ontario is so big. So I am here in the uh, city of Markham and it is the traditional territory of five indigenous communities, including the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the Mississaugas. And this land is part of the Williams Treaty of 1923. I'd like to point uh, your attention to the right of the screen. You will see uh, a map of the territories that I just mentioned. This is an excellent resource, one that I've used with my class uh, as well to visualize and conceptualize what exactly we're talking about in the land acknowledgement. So I do encourage you to check out this resource. Uh, you could just uh, copy the link if you're able to in the PowerPoint and you are able to find your own location and see uh, which territory, traditional lands you are on as well. 
Uh, I want to take a moment to introduce my wonderful colleague, Ashley. I've had the opportunity to work with her and learn from her over the past few months. And can I just say, she never fails to make us laugh and teach us something new. And that's not even <laughs> included in her bio yet. So uh, Ashley is the Indigenous Education Coordinator for Elections Canada in Northwestern Ontario. Based in Nipigon, Ontario, Ashley Nervala is a member of the Red Rock Indian Band. Previously, Ashley worked at the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit Community Liaison for Lakehead District School Board, and she is known for her collaborative nature and her dedication to her community. So that's Ashley for you. Now, before I dive into uh, this conversation, I just want to frame our conversation with uh, the main question and remind ourselves that the, the question we are seeking to answer today, and we will not be able to answer it entirely because it's such a big question, but it's who are Indigenous peoples? Uh, now, this will act as a context and a great foundation for our subsequent sessions to build off of. So definitely look forward to that in the coming weeks. Uh, but with that, I'm very excited to begin our conversation. Let me just stop sharing my screen here uh, with Ashley. So Ashley, I'm just, I wanna know what is, what is it that you do at Elections Canada and why is this work important to you? Hi, so first of all, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here with all of you. Um, as Melissa said, I do work out of Nipigon, Ontario, um, which is the Robinson Superior Treaty Area. That is also my treaty area. Um, but today I come to you from Thunder Bay, which is more of the Fort William First Nation Treaty Area. Um, I'm double booked, so we're here and I'm excited. And if you're wondering why the sun is beaming on me, it's it's because I'm magical like that. But no, just kidding. It's because my vehicle is facing facing the um the sun and it's it's quite beautiful. I'm happy to be here. So I the kind of work that I do is I take our education resources and I go into schools and first nations and communities and I look to build relationships, educate students and teachers um and assist in their classrooms with all of these things and the big questions that come with this stuff right like the why's the how's the the when did that change all of that stuff and so that's what I do in in the context of my position right now and I really love it thank you you and she, you know what guys she's absolutely right she is magical she she <laughs> denied it but she is magical uh but thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your work Ashley and as you know today our conversation is about understanding the foundation. So I want to start with the question of terminology. Yeah. We know this, this uh, title is called Indigenous Stories and Experiences, but so we encounter this word Indigenous a lot, and how is that different from First Nations? And there's also words that we no longer use in our context today. It feels like a lot, so help me unpack that. Yeah, so and you'll notice this a lot in your school boards too. Um, so for instance, you'll see, you know, um, you'll pull out an old document or policy in your board and it'll say native, or you'll pull out something, um, from a government website and it'll say Indian and then a different website, like say from Anwa or the Thunder or like the indigenous friendship center, uh, they'll, they'll have different terms. And so the reason for that is, um, we still use Indian because it's in law, it's in the Indian Act. In fact, my status card says it's a certificate of secured Indian status. And so it's still being used and it's used in a law form. However, most Indigenous people, most First Nation people view that as a derogatory, negative way to identify as a group of people. So most people in my area prefer First Nations or Anishinaabe. Um, and of course, Indigenous is like the way of umbrella. It's the umbrella that holds First Nation, Métis, and Inuit inside it all. And so you'll often, you know, maybe wonder, well, yeah, but isn't that Aboriginal? Yes. However, so Aboriginal took place, took the place of Native. Aboriginal was, was bestowed upon us by the powers that be. And 
in a sense, like it was great at first. And then people kind of went, oh, but but when you break down the word, like ab means not and original. So so it's essentially saying we're not original. So that's why that one's not as liked as indigenous. However, it's a it's a perspective thing. It's a personal thing. Like my dad personally, he was like, what's indigenous? Like he couldn't even say the word. Um, and so he was like, I'm an Indian. Like that's what my card says. And and so that was very personal for him. And and he's of the older generation. So, you know, it, it kind of that plays in too. There's so many different ways to have perspective with it. But Indian is considered not a politically correct term anymore unless you're speaking with regards to the law. And therefore it's now Indigenous, First Nation, Metis, or Inuit. Perfect. Thank you, Ashley, for breaking that down for us and giving some of the uh, context and understanding the nuances for these terms. And it was very interesting that you mentioned your father and his perspective on it, how it's different. So it's important for us to keep that in mind, that it's different for whoever you're speaking to. And it's important to, you know, ask those questions as well. Yeah, absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with, you know, when you're when you're working with say an indigenous elder like do you prefer to be indigenous or are you a first nations elder are you a metis senator you know like it's okay to ask if you're not sure yeah yeah and and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to ask some of those questions today in our q a as well yeah absolutely yeah so now that we know some of the terminology i want to explore what we know about uh these unique groups of people that fall under the category, that umbrella term that you say Indigenous. For example, um, First Nations people. A lot of what we know, uh, what we learn about First Nations people come from history. Um, A big one that we talk about in schools now is residential schools. We talk about the Indian Act, but that is in history. And of course, these pieces are important, but how can we connect those stories in the past to the experience of First Nations peoples today. What is your take on that? So, I mean, for me, it's an easy answer, but I understand it's not that way for everyone. So that's that's my family's lived experience. Um, and so when people started talking about the residential schools or, you know, when people started, when the news started reporting on the, the recovery of, you know, children's bodies at the schools, we already knew that stuff took place. So it was it was very validating and vindicating for our people. But but teaching it is a totally different thing because you never know who in your classroom has had those similar experiences. You never know if those students are listening the way you need them to be listening and then they'll take it home in a good way or if one little word changes and it now becomes something that's so horrific and it's a big publicity thing in your board. I've seen it happen. It's it's just got to be done carefully. And so by acknowledging um, the factual history, you can't do it wrong. However, if you're concerned about like, this is what we did, because even I would do this as an Indigenous person in a classroom, um, I would I would call in the elders. I would call in supports. I would you know, if, if I have family members of students that want to come in and share with the classroom, I would do that. And so just being sure to be mindful of of what you're teaching and who you're teaching, I think is is the most important thing. It it can be done. And it's, of course, you know, very tedious work. But I mean, you could say the same thing about the Holocaust or about other things as well. And so, you know, just making sure that that you have the right supports in there for yourself and for your students. That's right. And thank you so much for bringing, uh, talking about the supports, right? We are, as teachers, we are not in there alone. Uh, We have so many resources that we can reach out to. Um, But uh, speaking of the, you know, the history of it, it's, it's important for students to understand that this is not just something in the past. It's yeah. something that continues to impact the the lives of Indigenous peoples here now today. So how can we bring those stories up front when it seems to be overwhelmingly about those uh, stories in the past and, and how those tie to and bringing those to the present? I think um, once your classroom becomes a safe space, 
if, if you have Indigenous students in your classroom, they're going to share their stories. They're going to share their family's stories if they feel safe. Um, if they don't and you want to share things like that, call the Friendship Centre, call call ONWA, call the closest First Nation to you. There's usually programming that takes place. And, and they also have cultural pro programming in their education departments that helps connect your curriculum to mm. the culture. And so those things exist and it's like where I'm from and I've never met anybody who's not encouraged those kind of relationships to be built within school boards with teachers. Like you don't need your liaison to call a first nation and say, Hey, we have a teacher that's teaching this. And we're wondering if, you know, you know, anybody that wants to come in and, and share, you know, um, nine times out of 10, the teacher can call themselves if they're comfortable with that. And, and it happens all the time. And it works out great. And then now you have a lifelong partnership with this elder or this community. And and maybe now your kids are going there and maybe you're harvesting medicines off the land and working that into your foods class. Or, you know, you're looking at tree rings and history class. And now you're in geography. And like, there's so many things because our Indigenous education is all education. I love that. I love that. So and you mentioned the friendship centers, you mentioned talking to elders. Do you have any other resources that you can point us to so that we can learn more? Yeah, I, I probably have a really great list, Melissa, that I can provide you with um, in the next day or so that you can share with the group. But but thank you for addressing those questions. Uh, those uh, those are the, the main questions that I wanted to address in our, our, our conversation. So thank you again for sharing your expertise and your insights. And everyone, if you do have more questions for Ashley, we do have a set time to ask those questions at the end of the session. So do uh, keep those questions handy and be sure to ask them uh, during our Q&A. So thank you again, Ashley. And so, Melissa, I just so you guys know, I'm going to shut my camera off, but I'm still going to be here. Okay, thank you. Okay, perfect. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Please let me know if you can see it. Speaking of resources that Ashley mentioned, she she mentioned reaching out to uh, friendship centers. She talked about reaching out to elders and uh different, there's so many different resources out there that we can access. And now I just want to take some time to share with you another resource that is great for learning about the history and lived experience of Indigenous peoples in Canada. And that is Elections Canada's very own Voting Rights Through Time resource. And why I selected this resource is because it shows how First Nations people and Inuit people experienced elections and democracy and how their experience is different from other groups. So it does a really good job of showing those snapshots and you'll have a, a moment to explore that in a second. But before I show you what that resource looks like, I want to give you a little bit of context of what Elections, re uh, elections Canada's resources are. All right. So first of all, when I talk about Elections Canada and talk about uh, elections in general, we think civics. You're right, but also not. Because it is not only in civics class that we can learn about elections in democracy. And we are very intentional about this. We build in historical elements and geography elements and even math elements and uh, literacy and media literacy. All these pieces you'll find embedded in our resources. They are collaborative and we engage students by drawing on their experience, drawing on their uh background, their, their culture, and bringing that into the conversation. So it's definitely very engaging, and we ensure to make it accessible uh, and for everyone. Now with each lesson, and you're going to see this in a moment, we have a big idea and an inquiry question. And I know what a day plan is supposed to look like. I know there's so much planning involved in being a teacher. So we got you. We were thinking of that and thinking of how busy you are ahead of time. So we have the entire lesson plan structured out for you, starting with the minds on all the way to the consolidation. And of course, uh, we have hands on materials as well. Uh, unfortunately, we are unable to use uh, the physical 
uh, pieces, but each of our resources comes with tangible elements such as a game board or cards uh, that your students can play around with, interact with, and they are all free and they can be shipped to your doorstep uh, or your school when you order. Okay, so let's talk about voting rights through time, this resource. Okay, so I'm just going to do a brief run through of what this resource looks like. Uh, not going in too much detail about each piece, but I just want to give you a taste of what our resource looks like, and then I'll give you a chance to experience it as well. All right, so uh, I'm going to need your help for this part. So please join me. Uh, first, I want you to think of a time when you felt excluded. Okay, you don't need to tell me what that time was or what that experience was. What I want you to do instead is think of one or two words to describe how that felt to be excluded. How did it feel? You can go ahead and put that into the chat. Go ahead. One or two words to describe how you feel. I see some words coming in. So this is very important because we're bringing our students experience into their learning. Right? We're not just telling them, oh, these people were excluded. We're now asking them to think of their own experience. And this way we can foster that empathy when we're looking at history. Next, I'm going to ask you to do the same for uh, the feeling of inclusion. Again, think of a time where you felt included and, and use one or two words to describe that feeling. One or two words. How does it feel to be included? This is uh, social emotional learning is a big part of our curriculum. So this is a great chance for to teach our students how to identify and describe how we are feeling. Now, the bigger picture here, like I mentioned, is to bring these feelings to the top of the mind. So when we're talking about history and, and a lot of my students have said this, too, is like, who cares about the past? But we have to think of the past as people of the past. They have experience and we can connect in that way. We are humans here and they were humans back then, but they share those emotions and we can bring that to the forefront of our learning. Comfortable, I see, beautiful. All right, so that is our minds on portion, which leads us to the activity portion of our resource. Here, students will be put into small groups. In each of the small groups, they will explore a different case study. One of them is First Nations peoples, Inuit people, women's, uh, youth, uh, Japanese Canadians, and looking how each of these groups experience elections and democracy in Canada differently. So what they're going to do is they're going to have a stack of cards, and you're going to see this in digital form, a stack of cards showing uh, an event in history um, of their experience in Canada, whether it be a passing of a law or a new restriction. And what the students have to do is they have to decide as a group if this event is inclusionary or exclusionary. So you have to have these conversations. So uh, the online adaptation is what we're going to be working with today, but it, it's very interesting how these stories are so different. And of, this is not the full history The our resource is not able to capture the entirety of uh, the, the history, but these are snapshots, but even then to compare those, right? Uh, and now this, this is a very loved part of our resource and we call it the turning point frame. This is great for our history teachers out there. What we're gonna do, what we ask students to do after they've placed all these cards on the timeline is they have to decide on which part of the timeline is considered a turning point? Now, this doesn't have to be, oh, things started becoming good from this point. It's just when things start to change. And this is great for developing that historical thinking and how we periodize or conceptualize things that happened in the past and really reflect on the entirety of this history. Okay. So with that, we come together and we look at the different timelines. So we have the First Nations story here, the Inuit story here, the, the Japanese Canadian story here. And we ask students to compare it and see what, what surprised you? How are they similar? How are they different? And spark those conversations. And finally, we end with a video and an infographic of what voting rights look like now. Uh, and that is always exciting. Uh, we also have an exit ticket uh, for students to write personally. This could be extended to a journal, whatever suits your classroom. Okay, so I have 
been talking a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. So now it is your turn to experience this uh, resource for yourself. For our purposes, we will focus our attention on the First Nations case study as well as the Inuit case study. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you so much for participating in our breakout activity. I heard some fun conversations, uh, and, and that's exactly what we're hoping for with this resource. Uh, before I go ahead with uh, some consolidations and ask, ask about you know your takeaway from that activity, I wanted to show you what the resource actually looks like uh, with the hands-on material that I mentioned before. So you saw the digital version. This is what it, it's, it's big. This is what it looks like in person. So each group, each small group would have access to a board that looks like this. As you can see, we have the inclusion over here, the exclusion over here, and you would have to place these cards on the map. And the cards that I refer to look like this. So for those of you that did the First Nations case study, uh, you would go through each of these cards and each card would say, uh, talk about the events that happened. And the nice thing about this is we also have the language learner version available. So if you want to uh, get your hands on this resource, you can uh, definitely order it on our website that we just put in the chat below. Um, but more on that in a minute. I want to know, what are some things that came up in the conversations? What are your takeaways? Uh, did it kind of shed light on the experiences of First Nations and Inuit people? Every time I, I went into a room, I, I often heard the word exclusionary. And uh, I know that that was a common thread uh, for some of the cards here. But hopefully, through those conversations, you can look at how uh, change happened over time. It's sometimes a good and sometimes not so good and sometimes hard to tell if it's good or bad. So hopefully you can use this resource in your classroom as well to explore the experiences of First Nations uh, and uh, Inuit people uh, as one of the, the pieces uh, in your in your uh, learning together. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump back into my PowerPoint here. Yes, yes, thank you, Natalie. Uh, Natalie says the cards really emphasize how important it is to be included in decisions about yourself. You're absolutely right. And that's why we want to start with that question of how does it feel to be included? Because if we just jump right in with this experience, it's hard to relate to. But students have experienced inclusion and exclusion, of course, to different degrees, but they know what it feels like. So to start with that question, bringing yourself and putting yourself in someone else's shoes is something we really try to do here. So thank you so much for that, Natalie. I completely agree with you. Wonderful. Um, our group talks about how different answers can be depending on students' experience and knowledge. Absolutely. For some students, this could be their story. But for others, this could be the first time they're ever learning about uh, Indigenous histories. So uh, different starting points. I think this is a great way to springboard into uh, deeper conversations of, you know, this is just the lens from elections uh, in democracy. But what about looking from... Um, the economic standpoint or looking at it through a, a feminist standpoint, those are different lenses and, and different conversations. The Minds On definitely supports this. I'll ask if you were there, would you feel it? Oh, that is great. Taking that uh, Minds On question into the activity as well, Christina, I love that. That's brilliant. The historical impact of these events and how they continue to impact people today, right? The Indian Act um, was enacted many years ago, but still impacts people to this very day. Thank you so much for that, Christina. Now, with that said, 
I'm just uh, being a little mindful of the time here. That was just one of our many resources that we offer at Elections Canada. We have 10 in total. Voting rights through time is one of them. Uh, in our next session, we'll be diving into civic action then and now. And in our final session, we'll be looking at does voting matter? So definitely stay tuned for that. And all of these resources are available to, to you for free, including all of the the, the cards and game board that I mentioned before, as well as a teacher's guide that explained what I explained in a much better way um, in a book form looking like this. And you are able to access all of this uh, electro electronically and physically on our elections and democracy website just listed there. And if you have any further questions about this, definitely feel free to email me. My email is right there. Not only do uh, we offer these resources, but we also have in-person classroom demonstrations uh, that as an option. What we want to do is, you know, we know teachers are busy, but what we could do is I can come in as a regional education officer and come in and demonstrate this resource for you in your class, have those discussions, and then you can go ahead and adapt it to whichever way you'd like uh, moving forward. So that is something that we do as well. Okay, that's voting rights through time. Thank you for going through that with me. I want to talk a little bit more about your questions now. Uh, we talked about so many things today. We talked about terminology. We talked about how history connects to uh, lived experience today. We had a chance to look at voting rights through time. Uh, and so now you have an opportunity to ask some questions. So please feel free if you have any questions, any comments to please uh, either turn on your mic uh, have a conversation with us, or you can uh, definitely put your questions in the chat as well. We will keep an eye on that. Okay, so this is your time um, to ask any questions. It doesn't even have to be related to what we mentioned earlier. It could be your own wonderings, and we encourage those as well. Okay, I, I see Toby has, uh, says, would you do a virtual presentation like this to teacher candidates in Absolutely. I've, I've done a presentation like this to my old uh, Bachelor of Education program uh, at Tyndall University, uh, but a virtual option is definitely possible. So not only is it classroom demonstration, but schools as well. I see a Taseem, you have your hand up. Sure. Thank you so much, Melissa, um, for helping us do the demonstration on this. Uh, every time we do this activity, we end up with a different perspectives and opinions and lenses that we can bring to it. I'd love to get, Ashley, your thoughts and opinions on how how does this feel as an Indigenous person? Do you, is there representation and what have you heard from your community regarding um, this particular resource? Yeah, thanks. So um, when I go to First Nation communities or when I'm in in a you know fully first nation classroom um i hear you know i feel included in this resource it's so nice to see myself reflected here um throughout history because that's not the kind of history that's really taught or or it is now but it wasn't then and so you know i'm hearing a lot of inclusion talk when when i present this resource for myself that's exactly how i feel too not often am I included in history? And so it's quite nice to be included. And, and that's not at all what I thought this job was going to be. So I was quite surprised when I started. Thank you, Ashley. Yeah, thank you so much, Ashley. And, and it's great to hear that feedback from yourself and from your community as well. Um, for those of you who do not know, our, our resources are uh, developed in conjunction with other educators across the country. Uh, and we make sure to have their voice on uh, how these resources are piloted and how each piece is very intentional. So we definitely seek to have that authenticity piece as well. Well, Ashley, do you have any thoughts that you would like to share? Um, no, not at the moment. I do look forward to the next two sessions, though. I feel like um, once school is back in the swing of things, that there'll be maybe more teachers participating or maybe more engagement. Like I'm, I'm not even, I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm personally not there yet. Um, but, 
did you see the question in the chat from Toby about would you do a virtual presentation like this to a teacher candidates? And is there a cost? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, I, I addressed it just briefly, uh, Toby, if you would like, I'm happy to connect with you. I shared my email in the chat. Uh, and I'm very excited to uh, speak and learn more about your programming. And I'd be happy to do a virtual session with your teacher candidates as well at Brock. Well, that is great. Thank you to all of you for sticking around and for participating in our first webinar. I'm very excited for our next webinar which will be happening on September 11th, we will be exploring the question of how have Indigenous people responded and what are some civic actions that they've taken. Uh, so I look forward to that as well. So definitely uh, get some rest. We are going back to school in just a number of days. Get that sleep and uh, I I'm I remember some of you just said that you'd just like to jump right into it. So I hope you have fun as you jump right into the school year. Best of luck and thank you again for having me this evening.